It was, I think that that conversation with my brother, Thomas being like, I'm going to give it one last go because my oldest brother was like a role, role model for me. And he's like a very good role model. And he, and he like would always give me these good advice. And I, I didn't want to let him down. And I, cause I knew if I let him down, then like other people would be looking at me like, yeah, what the fuck? That's what I told him. I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm not crazy here. Like, I'm not going to do this until I'm 25 making $0 and then try to figure out my life. Like I'm going to go back. And I started signing up for classes at LaGuardia College over here. Then I think a couple of weeks later, you know, I, they hit me up to be in that video. And I just was working there for the next like two or three years. The, the reason why I was able to continue making content was because of that day and because of that job. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. This is the podcast where you can hear the life stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Joe Santagato, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating and review. Share this episode with a friend and subscribe to the show. But a brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new takeaways episode is an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single Thursday. And now without further ado, I am very excited to present to you my conversation with Joe Sanagato. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Today on the show, we are joined by Joe Sanagato. Joe is the host of the popular podcast, The Basement Yard. He's also an entrepreneur, creator, co-creator, and founder of things like Speak Out, Pay the Price, and more. And I'm very excited to have him here on the podcast today. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, man. I'm excited to have you here. And where I want to start, I want to go all the way back to the beginning born and raised in New York City, right? Astoria, if I'm not mistaken. You are correct. And so like, I've heard you like, what was, what were you like as a kid growing up? Like I've heard you describe kind of your family as essentially middle class, basically. And so like, um, what were like, what was your childhood like growing up in Astoria? Um, well, you know, I, I actually, I grew up with a lot of kids. So I had a lot of friends uh, who I'm still friends with to this day. There was like 12 or 15 of us. And, and we just kind of all met at the park and like, so every single day, like I was never home, I would go to school. Uh, and I started like walking to school too, in like third or fourth grade, which is like, thinking back, I'm like, mom, like, you know, like it's a little young, but I would walk to school with, with my buddy, Frank, who I do the basement yard with now. And then after school, we go straight to the park and we stay there until I had to be home for dinner. And that was like my whole life basically. Um, but yeah, we grew up like middle-class, like we, we had a, a like a house, um, but we like never went on vacation. So we had like a nice home, but we never went anywhere. Uh, we went to Disney World once because my dad, uh, he was a fireman and also he had his own construction company. And uh, one time he just did a job for tickets to Disney World. Like we had like a bunch of tickets that he had gotten. So he did it like in exchange for that. So that was like our only vacation. <laughs> okay. As a, like, as a kid too, were you creative? Cause like, I've heard you say that like, you're not entirely sure where the creative gene came from, right? Within your family. Like I know like your dad's funny, but like, where do you think this creativity developed? Um, you know, I probably should have do more thinking about that, but I mean, I think it was just always something that sort of interested me. You know, I, I, I would say for the most part, I think the only thing that was pretty consistent, because it's not like I was like really good at drawing and I was interested in this and that. Like, I really didn't have any of those things. Like I, I think the only thing um, that has been consistent is that I've always pretty much done like whatever I wanted to do, whatever that meant. Like I was never worried about like being cool or like how this was going to be perceived at all. Like I just kind of just wanted to do my own thing. And I there was a time when I was younger like we have an old home video where I was like maybe four or five and my mom had this big ass fucking video camera. They look like bazookas. And I, I'm like, try, I'm asking her like, yo, let me film. First of all, I wouldn't even be able to hold this thing up. It was fucking huge. Like it was huge. So, but I would ask her like, oh, I want to film. I want to film. So I like, that was like interesting to see. Like, oh, I had some sort of, you know, interest in it. And, and, and it wasn't because I had an interest in cameras. Cause I don't, I don't know anything about cameras. Like I'm not like super interested in editing or anything like that or production. Like none of this is really very interesting to me. It just happens to align, honestly. Um, like yeah, I could very well be like, oh, you know, it started from a young age. This, but I, I really never had an interest in any of that. I just thought it was cool to be able to create something 
for people to sort of enjoy. And it actually started with Frankie. We would make these videos on a camera that my mom had gotten me. Um, it recorded on like cassette tape. So you would have to rewind and record over it as editing because there was no fucking like editing program that I really knew about. Um, and then we just loved like being able to play it for like my sister and shit. Like that was pretty much like all we were really interested in. So I guess like I was more interested in being a center of attention narcissist than anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you met Frankie like in, uh, was it, was it a PS2 where you met Frankie? Technically. Yes. Yeah. So we, we met because our sisters were really good friends uh, and they're four years older than us. Um, but we actually did a year together in pre-K when we were younger and we were like good friends back then, I remember. So that was in a different school, the uh, school of St. Francis of Assisi. So I went there and then I think he did kindergarten there, but I left and I went to PS2 that you mentioned. Got you. And it's crazy that that friendship almost didn't last because of a fruit roll up. Dude, you have no idea. Uh, there's so many like stories like that too, where something had happened and Frankie was just like the most dramatic fucking kid ever and be like yo um one time this girl kelsey gave me this thing in second grade that said um he was like a card or something and it said like love your best friend kelsey and he was like i thought i was your best friend and he was like mad about that i'm like bro like he was just it was crazy (laughs) yeah and so like i'm curious too like with school growing up like you went to pretty diverse schools right yeah how does that affect growing up because like i went to like i grew up in like mid midwest manitoba or midwest canada in manitoba was like very much like not a diverse school like how does that affect you growing up going to a diverse school i think that you know it it really made me just more accepting and sort of just i guess like aware of other people and their cultures and like whatever that you know may mean um because when you're a kid and something's different you know, it's like funny or it's like whatever, but it's like you, you learn about it. And then like, you know, either people tell you like, uh, you know, that's offensive. Like you don't say that to these types of people. So you like learn along the way. Like it was very hard for me to wrap my head around like racism. Cause I'm like, how do these people like say things like this? Like, how do they not know? But then like, as you get older, you start to realize like people live in a town where it's just white people for 20 miles in every direction. So they've never even like seen a black person, an Indian person, or like any of it. Like, and it's just, it was so crazy to me because especially I, I believe Queens is one of the most diverse places like in the world. And the school that I went to, we had friends that were Greek, uh, uh, Indian, Spanish, black kids, white kids. Like we had a Greek kid, like everybody was sort of there. So it, when you're young and you're trying to just, you're just like open to the, these kinds of people, you don't even have a chance to like really understand. You just sort of accept everything as a, as a child, you know? So I think that it, it helped to, to that as well. And also as, as far as like it pertaining to comedy, like you, you have to, at least in my like experience, because like I said, I think the only thing that I really was interested in is, is like, especially when I'm trying to be funny, is like being the center of attention and being funny. And, and what that requires is knowing your audience and trying to make everyone laugh. So when you grow up around a bunch of different people, you know when these kind of jokes would work and these kind of jokes would work or something like that. Uh, so I think that also helped too, because you, you grow up around a bunch of different people and you have, if you're trying to make them all laugh, then, you know, that's, it's like, you know, it helps to sort of adjust. How much of a switch is it for you to flip, to go from, to trying to be that funny person that's the center of attention? Cause like in, in your content, a lot, oftentimes it can feel like a pretty natural thing that's happening. It's like, how much of a switch do you have to flip to get there? It's not much of a, a, a switch. I mean, it, it used to be like, I'll be honest, like the, the YouTube videos that I was doing for a long time, like I, I was never like that. You know what I mean? Like now it's a little different because like I, I was making those videos and it was, I think that I was younger and I was just trying to find my way in a sense, like, you know, like musical artists, they like put out like some shitty songs when they're younger or, or they're like, the beginning of their career, even when they're super popular, like now they make completely different music. It's like, they were still trying to find, you know, what, like their, their place. And I think that's kind of like what happened where it started as this thing. And then you're, you're getting older and it just changes. But that sort of, to me was like a character because they're very like that person. I know all the videos is very like 
loud and angry and, and like, you know, this and that. Now, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's, I'm not like, you know, demonizing whatever the fuck I did. I'm just saying like, it, it just feels different than now. I feel like it's a little more like silly and a more like lighthearted and not very like fucking, I don't know, just, I don't know the word, but it's so direct and like brash. But um, yeah, I think like now it's it's not much of a switch. It's it's pretty much like how I am. Like if, if you watch the Basement Yard podcast and, you know, me and Frankie just kind of riffing back and forth, like we've been doing that for our entire lives. So that's a little more natural and, and more up to speed of like how, you know, I am when I'm trying to be funny, when you're with your friends and just fucking, you know, goofing off or doing whatever. Uh, but yeah, but like the other person, like I said, with the videos, like a lot of people would meet me in person. They would say something like, you know, you're a lot more calm in person. I was like, yeah, well, I'm making it like, these are videos that I'm making. You know what I mean? Like, it's not necessarily like exactly how I'm acting all the time. Um, but yeah, as of right now, it's like the switch isn't even all that, you know, crazy. It's, it's pretty like natural and that's how, you know, I, would like to keep it as well just like more up to speed so it's not too far in any sort of direction because i don't think it even needs to be that yeah no and like you said too it's like just you and frankie kind of riffing back and forth and it's something that you've already you've been doing right like i think what was it like back in the day your friends had a film class or something and the two of you guys kind of got involved even though it wasn't your class and spent like more time on the project than your friends did or something like that yeah when when um our friend Nick was a year older than us and he went to the uh, Bryant high school over here and they had a video class and the class was kind of like, I don't want to like put down anyone's profession, but I feel like the class was more of just kind of like an elective. So it was very easy to get like a good grade in this class, but we just took it to the extreme. Cause like that was at the time where me and Frankie started making these videos on that camera that I was talking about that my mom got me. And this was like when Jackass was like popular too. So we were like throwing shit at each other. Like it was like, stupid shit but they had a project that they just had to make like a movie or something and me and frankie were already making those videos so we were like oh let us do it so we ended up doing it and then frankie was the next year so he did one and then one of our friends is a year younger than us so then he had one and we did all three like every single year we had this movie that come out and it was the same like premise it was about like my brother keith being like a murderer and it was like <laughs> he was killing everyone in the house because it was like an acronym for his name it was kill everyone in the house so he was a murderer and like we would just make these videos like three in a row. Uh, so it was, it was kind of funny, but yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I have one other question about school before we kind of move on. And I'm curious what led to the grade six headband phase? Oh God. Well, actually, no, it was grade five. It was grade five. And um, I don't know, man. I thought, I think I just thought it was fucking cool. I wanted to be like Alan Iverson and shit. So I just, I, I, you know, and you know, what's crazy. I think also that day I like spiked my hair with gel, which I never did. Like I never did that when I was younger, but for whatever reason I did. And I wore the headband and my fucking fifth grade teacher just chewed me out. She just fucking disrespected me. Like we were in class and she's just, she was known to be like, like a very stern, like everyone was afraid of this woman. Like they were like, Oh my God, when we get to fifth grade, like no one wants the schnitzer and we get to her class and then she uh she's like are are you are you okay and i was like yeah i'm i'm good what's up and she's like are you sweating i was like no it's fine and she's like well then take off the head and then i was like damn i took it off and i was like i'm not even talking for the rest of the day so she just fucking violated me in front of the whole class but she was a great teacher learned a lot back then she also kicked me out of sex education that was you know later on in the year that was a different kind of thing but why <laughs> She is, they, they, they did a sex class in the fifth grade and, uh, she said, um, it was the, literally the first class and I made it through like 10 minutes and then she said something like the penis is a miracle. And I was like, Oh my God, a teacher just said penis. And I like started laughing and she was like, all right, you're done. Like she would, they would kick people out of that class all the time though. Cause like anyone who was like not mature, like that's how they like not mature enough to stay, like not laugh and like really be there to learn. They were like, get the fuck out. So I got kicked out like 10 minutes in fair 10 so early for that class you know what i mean like what do, what do you expect like i know it's like dude i'm seeing an old lady say penis like give me a break no 100 percent. like that's when i did yeah sex ed for us was was grade five as well like when we were 10 years old it's just really i i it, anyways <laughs> moving on from sex ed um vlogging so originally when it like you originally started like in terms of internet content for lack of better social media was it vlogging uh no it it well vlogging I, I don't even know bro like uh, it's, vlogging came later but the first thing that I was doing um it actually kind of started on like Facebook so Facebook I would just like leave videos on people's walls all the time um 
it's kind of like I feel like it was like this. It's similar to what the kids do now, which is like Snapchat streaks, where they try to keep like a streak with them, and like, which is a very like dialed down version of what I was doing. It was just like you would put out a status on Facebook and be like, "Yo, who wants a video?" And then whoever would be like me, I'd just go to their page and like leave a funny video. And I don't even know what I was doing. I would just be talking and trying to be humorous or whatever. Um, so I would do that all the time. And then uh, apparently it was funny, which I, I'm pretty much guaranteeing it wasn't. Uh, but then some kid, one of my friends, Kevin McCarthy from high school, he like commented on a picture and I actually have a screenshot of it. He's like, yo, you should make a YouTube channel. And like, that's why I started doing it. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do on this channel, but I actually haven't said this in too many, like when people have asked me this or like interviews or whatever, but what the first video I made, I think people know this if they like, you know, do their due diligence, mm-hmm. like it is a video of me just waking Keith up. Like I like set up the camera and he was sleeping and I just screamed in his face and he like jumped up real quick. And that was, that's like off the internet. It was up there for like a little bit. There was nothing like crazy with it. But then I made another video because they were popular, not popular, but there was like a couple of videos that went have, that had went viral and it was drive by compliments. So I was driving in my friend's car. Oh, my friend was driving and I would lean out the car and I would scream compliments at people in like an angry voice. And it was just like, it was just funny to me. And I like posted it, I think on Facebook and I got like 13 views or something like that. But then that came off the internet as well. Um, and then I started, um, I did a vlog, I guess, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I think the inspiration from vlogging came from Wiz Khalifa, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, I forget what his vlogs were called, but he did some some vlogging shit, um, and I was a fan of his at the time. And so I, I like went to go get a haircut at my friend uh, John and Timmy's house, and there was a, a video that he like just shaved my head. Like I didn't even get like a lineup or anything. I just had him shave my head. I was getting buzz cuts back then. So I was like, whatever. And then the next day I decided to be like, yo, I'm going to use this camera. At this point I had a camcorder that my mom had got me. And I was like, I'm going to do these videos where I'm like talking into the camera, like Jenna marbles, because she was like blowing up at the time or she had already blown up at the time. Um, but I didn't really know anything about YouTubers or, you know, there was no, MCNs. There was no one making money. There was no influencers. There was no Instagram. There, I, I don't even think really anyone was using Twitter. Like this was before any of this shit, you know. So I, it was just kind of like fun to me, and I was like, oh, I can make the people in my Facebook laugh. So that's why I started doing that. And so when did the uh, the Lake House vlog happen? The Lake House vlog with tons of slow mo, I should say. Oh my god, there was so much slow mo. Um, that happened. <sighs> Uh, probably like 2012 or 2013, somewhere around there. And that was also inspired by the Wiz Khalifa thing. I was like, oh, they have a camera that follows them around and does whatever. And I was like, oh, we go to this lake house um, and we just like, you know, we we drink beers and just like go on the boat and like have a good time or whatever. Um, I also was just obsessed with like re-watching my life in a way which was weird because we had a friend her name is chelsea and she had a camera and she was into photography so when we were super young uh this is when facebook or like myspace and facebook when they made that sort of transfer this is very early on we would go to the park we'd just be playing sports and shit and she would just be taking pictures of us like all day and then at night we'd hang out she'd be taking pictures all the time and then she would upload them. Like we would wait until she uploaded them to Facebook, and then we just like go through them and, and look at the pictures. Um, so that was like our Instagram, um, and that I like really liked because you have like memories of the night, you know that you know whatever the fuck. So I was like, oh, I could do this like in video form. I didn't even know how to edit at that point, to be honest. Like I, I just like shot a bunch of video on this camcorder and then uploaded it, and I was like, all right, time to figure out iMovie and just kind of cut these things together. Um, those are also, I think, off the internet. So I was just like, I don't, you know, they're, they're just like pointless. Like, I don't know. It was just, it, it was just a very experimental time back then. It was just something I enjoyed to be able to like watch the night before and like create this sort of thing. 
And so were you posting anything on MySpace? And I'm asking specifically, so I have a quote here from the podcast I did with Frank. He said, Joe has the curse of good looks. He was also Joe. He was always Joe from something, whether it be MySpace or Facebook. Like he was Joe from MySpace. No, he, no, he's fucking lying. So Frankie does this thing where like, if I do anything, he, he, it's like Joe from this or whatever. Like I used to work at this company, Elite Daily. He's like, oh, Joe from Elite Daily. Like he just like does all the shit. MySpace, I was not popular in any sort of facet i didn't post any content there or like whatever i and i didn't have like a fucking random followers that i didn't know like it was all people that i knew you know like there was nothing on myspace whatsoever facebook was more or less the same until i started making this fucking content so he's fucking full of shit uh but <laughs> no i never posted anything on myspace i didn't start doing anything until after high school so i, I or maybe like during high school is when i was doing like the facebook shit and then I started, I would say probably my, the summer after my senior year of high school is when I started making like content on the internet. And, it, you know, even then it, it wasn't like a popular thing to do or, you know, whatever. People didn't really understand what the fuck was going on. Yeah. Cause that was like when you for like 2011, probably when you started. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And so how long did it take you to get to AdSense and how long did it take you to lose your AdSense? Uh, it took me so I think it was just a lack of awareness of like how like being able to apply for AdSense I think now you could just do it whenever the fuck but you, you do have you did back then have to uh get it somehow I, I don't know what you needed to do maybe a certain amount of videos or a certain amount of watch time or something but I'm pretty sure you could just get it actually that's not true I think now eh, I think eh, whatever but it doesn't matter but I, it took me a little while and I was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, do this AdSense thing. I get paid for doing this. And I did it. And I remember getting this sort of thing. It was like a postcard in the mail. And it said that I had made one cent, like literally one cent. Like, I'm not trying to make that sound like a cool story, but like it literally was one cent. And I was like, damn. And it wasn't even a check because you can't collect the money until you hit like $125 or something. And then they pay you out. So I had gotten this thing for just said one cent. And I was like, and I remember at the time being like, like this is cool because I'm just doing this shit. And I, like, I th that was the first moment that I was like, damn, this is really fucking cool that I can make money doing this. Um, and I remember my dad saying to me, like, how many subscribers do you think you need? And this is how out of touch and, and how old this thought process is. He was like, how many subscribers do you think you need in order to like do this for a living? And I was like, like 12,000. 12,000 subscribers, which now, you know, we know you have 12,000 subscribers. You're literally making probably like $50 a month, if that. Uh, and so that's how out of touch I was. And yeah. And then I ended up losing it probably like a week after that. I think like, I don't, I don't think I got, actually, that's not true. I think it was a couple weeks after that. Cause I remember looking at my AdSense account, like religiously, like just like refreshing and watching myself make like 13 cents. And I was like, damn. Um, but then I got, you know, there was no MCNs, which are like these networks that kind of protect you from, you know, any sort of weirdness like this or help you get your thing back, whatever. I don't even think there was copyright strikes back then. Like, I think they just fucking disabled people. So I don't even know to this day what I was disabled for. But then they were like, yeah, you can't make money forever. So you're fucking done. I was like, OK, whatever. I mean, at that point, I wasn't making any money anyway. So I was like, you know what? This would just be cool to do. And it's a lot of fun. And I was then utilizing social media and at that at that time it was so exciting for me to be like wow like all these people are tweeting me or they're sending me uh you know messages on fucking facebook and, and or whatever wherever they're contacting me and i'm like these are people that i don't know these people are from the other side of the world they're in california you know like it was just a, an exciting time because it was all very new you know like now I, I feel like anyone who is you know 16 years old they they already get it like it's not very uh exciting to be like yeah of course you talk to people online that you don't know of course you know there are people if you're creating content that you know whatever like it was just something that it blew my mind at the time so it was like very exciting so there was like no way i was gonna like quit doing that just because i wasn't gonna make money from it you know yeah and i think like not even only the kids like no it's a possibility but they almost expect it when they start uploading content like they expect people from all over the world to flock to their content they're going to be a youtuber by the end of the week like they're just it's so ingrained in them now you know what i mean yeah 100 they they you know 
like you said, it's it's expected. It's it's kind of like the norm. Like like I said, the influencers didn't exist. And like now that's like a legitimate thing that you know, you ask a fucking third grader, like, what do you want to do? And usually it's just it was doctor, lawyer, fireman. And now it's like fucking influencer, YouTuber, and God knows what. I don't know. And so but you stuck with that channel. So that was Santa Gato TV, right? Like the original channel? Yeah. And so you stuck with it for a while. Like I think it was getting like 10 to 20 K views at the time, which is why you stuck with it. But you rode that account to like 300 something thousand subscribers, I think. Yeah, I think it was like 250 to 300,000 subscribers. And I was just like, I think at this time I was maybe 20 or 21 years old. And I really was like, damn, I don't because at the time, I didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do. Like, I would take these weird meetings with production companies where they were like, oh, we want to do a reality TV show with you and your family. And, you know, I was also very arrogant and, and like, dumb when I was younger. Like, I, I hated – I didn't want to talk to anybody. Like, you know, like, I never wanted to collab with anyone because I didn't want anyone to be like, oh, he's here because he knows this person or whatever. And anytime anyone name dropped, I would just be like, fuck this person. Like, uh, I was – I showed up to – one time I showed up to a meeting in sweatpants because I heard that – uh mark zuckerberg did that and i did that and i was just like oh my god dude what a fucking ass like looking back i was just such a fucking dick um but it's because i just i it was going back to what i was saying the only thing that's been consistent is that i'm like i want to do what i want to do and and like i I really don't care what the repercussions of that is like whether it's going to hold me back which it definitely has or if it's going to make me which i think it also definitely has so there are opportunities that i probably missed because i i don't like at the time, you know, wasn't taking too much advice because it was all very new to the whole world. So I was like, what the fuck can anyone really tell me right now? I'm just kind of figuring it out on myself and I'll live and die on my, uh, like with my decisions. So, you know, that's the kind of the route that I wanted to go with. I was just like, you know what, if if I fuck this up, fine, at least it'll be on me, but I'm not going to have someone like fumble a bunch of money for me or, or, you know, make me do shit that I don't want to do. But yeah. I guess. I don't even know if I answered the question. (laughs) I think you did. I think you did. But when it comes to collabs, I know like you said, you didn't do a lot. That's something I definitely noticed kind of like in prepping for this. But I'm curious what the story behind Settle Down Kids was. So, yeah. Oh, so what I, back to, this all kind of ties together actually. So I um, ended up jumping shit from that old channel because I was like, I can't make any money doing this and I'm, I'm getting older. I was 20, 21 years old. I was like, and I, but at the time I was like, you know what? This is just a good look. And I thought that like some casting director would see me and be like, oh, we're going to put him in a movie or something, which I have zero aspirations to be an actor, by the way. But I, like at the time I was like, that's where this is going. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to continue doing it. But then I was just like, you know what? I'm going to have to make money from this if I want to sustain it and keep doing it. Otherwise I just need to go back to school. And I told my oldest brother like oh i'm gonna go back to school after this summer if nothing happens you know then i'm just gonna go back to school i ended up getting a job at elite daily they offered me a job as an editor producer for them until i write like scripts and you know do some editing for them um and then during my time there i kind of just like jumped ship from that channel so i started back from zero um so i went from 250,000 or 300,000 to like zero there was some crossover, but it wasn't anything astronomical. Like it, it wasn't, I don't think it was like 60,000 subscribers or anything like that. But, you know, I also had my social channels to be able to like push shit out. And then I just knew like, I'm just going to consistently do this and I have a job now. So everything's fine. I can continue doing it. Um, but yeah, uh, this ties into the settle down kids thing because a lot of people were actually shocked that I did that, including them. Uh, but this kid, Joey Gatto, who I'm actually still friends with to this day. I talked to him this morning. He just reached out to me and was like, oh, we kind of have the same name. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. So uh, then he told me he was from New Jersey. And then he started mentioning how about like collab channels because that was big back then. It was basically like the boy band era of fucking, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I was and he was like, this is a way for you to make money on YouTube because you can make videos and get paid AdSense, whereas right now you are not, you know? And so I was like, all right, cool. This is a way to, this is actually before I did the jumping ship thing because I was making zero money. I was like, you know what? I can do this shit. These kids have whatever. I get my own day. I could like, because how it worked is like everyone would upload on a certain day. 
So it's like, I get my own day. I don't have to like be in a bunch of videos with these kids or anything like that. I could just do my own thing, <clears throat> do my own thing, open myself up to another audience and get paid. So I was like, you know what? That's what I'll do. Cause I didn't fucking know these kids. So I was just like, whatever, I'm just going to do this for me. Um, and then, uh, everyone was like what the fuck because apparently i had a reputation that i didn't know about because i didn't move to la and like have you know whatever of being an intimidating person which actually a lot of people i just uh trevor wallace just did my podcast and he told me that he told me the same thing he's like when i was watching your videos growing up like you came up very intimidating like a lot like it was just like this kid's fucking you know uh and so a lot of people were just like shocked that i was kind of doing this because the rest of like you know the rest of them were kind of more cookie cutter and you know do a certain type of content or like the antithesis of mine basically um but yeah i did that for a while and then after you know a certain amount of time i just kind of felt like you know i this is not really the place for me so i just kind of you know no knock against those guys they're really good kids but you know i just was like uh i can't and then what was mfa every day mfa every day was basically was the uh the vlogging channel so mfa is like the name of was the name of our uh our football team, like me and my friends, there was like a football league over here. It was like a rough touch league that we played in since we were younger and we were really good and we're fucking assholes too. Like we just blow people out by like 60, like five, we went undefeated five years in a row. Like it was so stupid and like whatever, but uh, the field that we, cause back to what I was saying before, all my friends, we had met playing sports. Like we never drank or did any drugs or any of that. When we were like younger so we just played sports like literally all day. And there was a field called Memorial Field that we would play on. Probably shouldn't be playing on it, but we were playing on it. And we would play football at night. We would spray paint a football white so that we could see it better. And we would play football at night and basketball during the day. And so we called ourselves the Memorial Field All-Stars, which is MFA. And uh, MFA every day was the vlogging version of the Wiz Khalifa thing because it was something every day um Wiz Khalifa's thing I, I don't remember what it was but it was something every day so I was like you know we're gonna be MFA every day and it kind of like rings so I, I I did that for a little bit none of these vlog channels by the way because I did that there was another vlog channel called Santa Gato Life uh there was probably some other one that none of these things lasted because like it's not really what I want to do it's just like I get this I wake up and I go yo this would be cool and then I do it and then consistency over time I'm like oh, this is not it you know let's not and earlier you mentioned i'm kind of jumping completely jumping ship here but you mentioned kind of how you're going to go back to school and i want to talk about how you originally dropped out of school because from my understanding you went to school for a little bit dropped out and were working at like a pizzeria or something like that yes i so god bless my parents because i lied to them so much uh in high school you have to like submit your application for high for college and like november december or something like that like very early on and i just fucking did it like i just didn't i told my mom i did and she's like where did you apply i was like you know places and i, I just like you know so yeah. i was like oh suny schools and this and that i didn't put an application nor did i even know how to do it like i just didn't even do any of that at all so then i went to my guidance counselor in like fucking april and was like i didn't apply anywhere like what do i do and she's like, well, you can't go anywhere. You're going to have to just go to the community college over here. And I was like, cool. As long as I get to go somewhere that my mom knows it's a building that teaches you shit. Uh, so I went to Queensboro Community College. They will literally take anybody. Uh, so I went there. And I did a semester there. I believe my GPA was like a like a 3.5 th or something like that. Because I was a good student. I just like didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I, and I was like, I had some sort of weird anxiety about going away and like not knowing that or have some sort of fucking plan. So I was just like, you know, and all my friends are here too. Like I was very much like a, you know, I'm going to live in this neighborhood forever kind of thing. You know what I mean? So I was kind of like, you know, uh, so, uh, yeah, after the semester, which was tough because, I mean, I signed up in fucking April. So I had classes that were on Saturday and Sunday at 8 a.m. There were math classes and I didn't miss any of them. Um, so I like did the work and I was like there and then I signed up for a second semester and then just didn't go. Like there were times where I would take because I had to take my dad's car. 
I would take my dad's car to campus and just park it right outside and like just not go in. I would just sit there for like 45 minutes and then go home so that they knew that I went somewhere. And I, I don't know why I drove all the way there because it's like 15, 20 minutes to go there. I could have drove like fucking around the block, parked it and just chilled. But I drove all the way there and I would just sit there and I, I just like, I don't know. And, and, you know, I don't recommend that to people. And I definitely don't. And because I didn't have a plan. I didn't know what I was doing. I, you know, I, this was before anything popped off for me. I, I just physically felt like this isn't it for me. And it wasn't because it was a lot of work and it wasn't because, you know, whatever. It, it just, and it really wasn't even because of, I was thinking of school as this thing that like I can like make it without it. And I could like, it wasn't any of that. It literally was just a feeling that I didn't understand or know what was going on, nor do I really even fucking, I don't know what to attribute to this, but I just like couldn't go. Like I, I like f- physically like just couldn't get myself to sit in these classes anymore. I was just like, I, I don't, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. And I, I dropped out, but I didn't tell my mom. <laughs> and then, um, after that second semester was over, I then told them like, oh, I'm not going to sign up for a third semester. Um, and they were like, well, you better figure it out. And I was like, yeah, like, but I fucking did it. And like for a whole year of my life, I, didn't, I don't even know what happened because I didn't have a job and I wasn't going, I wasn't going to school. And I just kept telling my parents like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll figure it out, this and that. And I was applying for like fucking jobs at like Foot Locker or whatever the fuck and not getting any of them. Um, so, and, and my friends now are also like, they're in college, they're doing shit and like whatever. So it was really like killing me. And like, it was really like making me upset. Eventually I got a job at a pizzeria though. And, you know, I just kind of kept telling my mom like, yo, just trust me, like I'll figure it out. <laughs> I didn't even believe that. after that. Like, I don't even know why I like, I had no plan, dude. Like I, no plan. Like I was making the YouTube videos during that year, but again, it wasn't a th- like no one turned it into a career. It was just a fun thing that I was doing. So it, it, there was no expectation from that. No, like, yo, I'm going to make it off this thing. And like, just trust me. It'll be the, like, I literally was just like, I need to figure out the fuck I'm doing with my life. But I, I, you know, after, after everything, my mom didn't find out that I dropped out and like, I just told you what I just told you. She knew I did a semester, the second semester that I signed for, and I kept driving and what she didn't find that out until like five years after it happened. I like, I like told her, I was like, Oh, by the way, I just like fucking, I would drive there and just not sit in there. Cause at that point it was like, now she can't get mad. Cause like I'm doing this for a living and like, you know, it's, everything's fine. I, I live in my own apartment. I was like, Oh, by the way, I didn't fucking, I just, I did this shit. And she's like, you're fucking, thank God. You know? <laughs> Yeah, because like you said, you had no job there for like eight months to a year, something like that. So like it wasn't always an obvious path. And I think there's one point you had like $150 in your bank account or something like that. And you took the test and were called to be a firefighter, right? Uh, Yeah. Well, when did I, that happen? So those are two separate things. So I had $150 in my bank account. I, had I remember this because I got paid $1,000 to go to Cortland, uh, which is a college. And they have this thing called the spring fling, which is like they have a concert and they have this and that. So during the day, they wanted me to set up like a table and just have like a meet and greet, which was like that. It like kills me to think that I did that. But a thousand dollars was just like an amount of money that I had never seen before. So I was like, what the fuck? They're going to give me a thousand dollars. Like I'm in there. So. Yeah, we went. And it was great. We went to the concert. We like picked up a few of my friends on the way there because they went to Syracuse. They went to Cortland. One of my friends went to Cortland. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I had that $1,000 and that lasted me through like the summer basically. And then I remember it being $150. And that's when I got the job at Elite Daily because they hit me up and they were like, come to this shoot. Um, we'll pay you $150. And I was like, that's literally, yeah, like I'm for sure coming to that. Um, and then they offered me a job right after we shot the, the video. And I was like, damn, I was like, fuck yeah. Like I definitely want to be a part of this. And that ended up being like, you know, the, the reason why I was able to continue making content was because of that day and because of that job, because they were like, we'll pay you, you come in here. And it was cool to be able to like, to have a job that like you're going into Manhattan for, you know, which was always just sort of like a weird dream of mine, which is like weird because 
I didn't want to work in an office. I didn't want to do the suit and tie thing. Like that just wasn't in the cards for me. Um, but I had this fascination with Manhattan and I used to take these weird long drives to the Long Island city piers um, and just stare at Manhattan. And I don't even know, like it would just, it had an aura for me. So it was very cool to be able to get that job. And it's like, I got to take the train into Manhattan for this job where I'm like editing and doing video. Like I am completely unqualified for this. I didn't go to school for this and I'm just like figuring it out along the way. And they're just kind of like trusting me. And, you know, it ended up, you know, working out amazing. And, and it was, it was just really lucky to, for all these things to kind of fall, you know, into my lap in the way that they did. You just have to be prepared for that opportunity, you know, which I was like <laughs> dying for. So I was super prepared. So how close then pre elite daily were you to quitting YouTube? Cause I was like, you had a point where you called your brother on the phone saying, you think you were going to quit YouTube. It's like, at what point was it? Like how close did you come? It was, I think that that conversation with my brother, Thomas was like, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure it was very close. Like definitely within a month of each other, of that conversation of being like, I'm going to give it one last go and you know, whatever. Cause my oldest brother was like a role, role model for me. And he's like a very good role model. And he, and he like, you know, would always give me these good advice. And I, I didn't want to let him down. And I, cause I knew if I let him down, then like other people would be looking at me like, yeah, what the fuck? So I, that's what I told him. I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm not crazy here. Like, I'm not going to do this until I'm 25 making $0 and then try to figure out my life. Like I'm going to go back. And I started signing up for classes at LaGuardia college over here. And, uh, yeah. Then I think a couple of weeks later, you know, I, they hit me up to be in that video and I just was working there for the next like two or three years. That's wild. And it's like, cause you said you were underqualified. So not only do you have a job in the city, but you have to go in and develop the skills that would then benefit your YouTube channel. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and how that happened was uh, I, I was on, I was not qualified for the job, but also like there wasn't really a, a specific job yet, you know, like I knew how to edit enough to do whatever they needed um, because they didn't need anything crazy yet. So this, the company was growing as I was growing. I got there, I was probably employee 28. And then the video team alone, at that time, the video team was three people. It was me, uh, you know, my friend Tyler and uh, a cameraman. And that was it. And so every day I would come in, I only work part time. I would get in at like noon and then leave at five or some shit. I don't even remember. But, and they would pay me $400 a week. And I was like, bro, what? I was like, I thought they were going to pay me $200. They gave me $400. I was like, this is amazing. So I felt like rich at that time because I remember when I had like $2,000 in my bank account, I was like, it's like I'm fucking paid now. Um, but yeah, so we, we, I, I was learning, you know, from this kid, Tyler is very, very good. He's like a, he has his own production company now. So he's very good at like getting shit done and like this and that. I learned from the cameraman as well. Then as the company grew, um, we hired uh, a guy who actually worked there before I did. Uh, for a little bit, but then I'm leaving. But then he came back, and he's like my mentor to this day. If I have any sort of question about the cameras, about production, lighting, anything, I always call him. Uh, and his name's Greg Parker, and he has a company called Top Notch Cinema. And he uh, taught me everything, basically. So I requested to sit next to him, and then I would always be asking him questions and always like really trying to learn a lot from him um, while while working there. Cause he was like, when he started editing shit, because at that point it was like, there was a couple editors, but no one was doing anything astronomical because again, no one needed any to do anything astronomical. But then once he came in, like all the quality of video like went up and I was just seeing him do shit. And I was like, damn, I need to like, like now I know I'm pathetic. You know what I mean? Like I was like, shit, like now this guy knows what the fuck's going on. So he was able to teach me a lot of things that I still use to this day. And, um, yeah, so I, I learned a lot from him, and I ended up quitting Elite Daily when I felt like I had reached as much as I could, uh, as far as like the knowledge of production and editing and and you know creating content. Um, when I felt like I have reached my intellectual ceiling here, that's when I sort of walked away from it and like pursued my own thing. And not only that, but you saved up like forty grand, so you would make sure you were safe when you took the jump, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I tell people it was forty grand because that's what I think it was, um, but it could have been less. But 
so I was making money from the YouTube stuff at that time because I had jump ship and then I was starting to make money. Nothing like astronomical, but I was making like okay money there. And then um probably some other like some random brand deals here and there. And then I think my salary um at Elite Daily was like forty five thousand or something like that. So and I was there for I think two or three years. So I, I never, and I fucking lived at home, so I didn't spend shit. And like, I wasn't like going out and fucking buying. I had not, I, all I did was create fucking videos. So I, I didn't really like spend money. So I saved up a, enough money that I was like, okay, at the very minimum. Also at that time, my channel was like getting more and more popular. So I was like, at the very minimum, I'll have this money and just let it sort of like bleed out slowly. And if it gets really bad, then I'll try and get another job. Either try to get hired here again or try to get a job as like a social media manager. Because if I could prove like I built this channel, clearly I know something about social media. So I was like leaning on that possibility as like a, you know, a backup plan. Um, but I, I, I knew what I had to do and everything was sort of growing at a certain pace. So I was like, I just need to keep this up, spend more time on it and, and you know, whatever. So that was enough for me for a safety blanket to be like, okay, I have this money. But also, the, everything is like going up. So like, I'll just fucking jump ship. Yeah, because you had you were probably you were close to a million, right? When you were still working at Elite Daily. Yes, yes. Because it was there. I think you said I, not on this podcast, but another one where you were at like a shoot with Elite Daily, and one of the influencers there thought you were there for the shoot as like one of the influencers, but you were actually there as part of the crew. Yeah, I we were we used to go to L.A. to shoot uh, this um, series that I was like the main producer for. Uh, called Generation Y, and we would go to LA to shoot with, with random like influencers and and do things like that. And I'm by the way, I'm still learning about this whole thing of like apparently the people in LA know who I am, people I've never interacted with, but apparently they see me as like, oh, this dude is like an OG. He's been doing it for like I've never talked to these people, so like I don't know any of this. You know, it's all like still like news to me. I keep hearing from like random people like, oh yeah, they were talking about you, and they were. I was like, what? I was like, I've never even. Sp- I've never talked to these people. Like I would love to have a conversation with them, but whatever. Um, but there's a kid who like I had known of because he was like popular on Vine at the time. Uh, he was in the shoot and I'm sitting in like the director's chair, basically. And I was like, oh, I think you're up next. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. He thought that I was just sitting in the director's chair like a fucking asshole. Like as the inf- like as a influencer there, just sitting in the director's chair being a fucking dick. But he got up there and then I like took out the paper and like went to go ask him like the the prompts or whatever. And he was like, wait, what are you doing? And I was like, what? And he's like, wait, you work here? I was like, yeah. He's like, why do you, why do you work here? I was like, I don't know how to answer that dude. Like, I was like, I do the social media stuff, but I have this job and the job was fucking great too. Maybe I would have quit that job uh, if it wasn't so great, but it was like awesome. It was a lot of fun. There was a lot of like camaraderie and there was, it was just great. Like I, I honestly had a great experience there. It was it was fucking awesome. So and I learned so much and made a lot of friends and shit. So, you know, I stayed there probably longer than I would have if it sucked. Um, but it was the greatest. So I stayed there for as long as I could and had the most fun that I could. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. So I, I don't I don't know that I had a million yet or anything like that, but I probably had like five hundred thousand or something like that. So it was like a you know, big enough that I guess people they get 200,000 now and they fucking move to LA and they call it quits on school and that's it. So I kind of waited. And one of those shoots was with Jenna Marbles, right? Yes. And that, and that was like, I was like a hero for that too. Um, and I felt like weird doing it because I, I like, I would never, like, I hate doing this shit, but my boss was kind of like, dude, this would help so much. And like, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, all right, man, because Jenna has always been very fucking cool to me, man. Like, and, and I, I haven't had the time to sit with her and really have this conversation. But when I was like first starting out, like she was the reason why I was like doing all this. Cause she like paved the road basically like made it possible of like, yeah, you can make these videos and like do it in like turn it into something. Um, and I remember sending her a fucking a message cause you could message people on YouTube. And I was like, Oh, we should collaborate. But I had like a fucking 87 subscribers maybe at the time. And, uh, yeah, so then I don't know how it happened the first time, but then she like, um, tweeted me or something or, or tweeted about me 
And I was like, what is happening? Like, this is fucking crazy. This is Jenna Marbles, you know? And then the first time I met her, I was at this event called Playlist Live in Orlando. And it was like an after party for like influencers or whatever, YouTubers. And I was there and I just like wasn't expecting anything. I didn't even know if she was there or not. But then like I walk into this place and mind you, this is like the peak of Jenna Marbles, like the person, you know? So she just like moves everyone out of the way and like runs up to me and hugs me. And like my friends are like, what the fuck? And ev- sort of everyone in there is like, what the fuck is happening? You know, so because they're like, who the fuck is this? You know, but she like ran up to me and she like hugged me and she was like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, what the hell? And I was just like, you know, I was just like, you know, at that point, I was just like, damn, this girl's like fucking awesome, man. She's really fucking cool. And there was another time that I saw her at something. I think it was in New York. And it was like the same sort of thing. And she's like, oh, take my number, take my number. And she like gave me her number. And, um, and everyone was just like, yo, what is ha- Like, what the fuck is going on? You know? So she was always very fucking cool to me. And I want to tell her that, but we haven't had the opportunity to like sit down and actually have, you know, a conversation about all that. But like, you know, uh, she, she was also, she was just always just very nice, you know, anytime that I interacted with her. And, and that was like very validating for me too, of just having her be like, you know, Oh, I'm a fan of yours. You're fucking hilarious. Like keep doing your thing. I was like, damn, you know, like, this is like, this is awesome. You mentioned how you saw her at Playlist. I feel like that's not something, granted like pandemic and everything, but that's like not something I would have known you for is like going to Playlist and doing the things like that. Like how long did you do that before you realized like this, this is not for me? I believe I went to two. I went to two of these things. One was in Philadelphia. The other was in uh, Orlando. And the only, and I knew at the time, like I, I, you know, this, this wasn't me. I didn't really fit in with the YouTubers or anything like that because I just found them to be strange or a lot of them, a lot of them, I think, you know, were just, just not, we just weren't into the same things, you know, like I had a lot of friends growing up and I had, and I, I was like very into sports and like, that's all I did. And like this, this thing is kind of like very separate from my actual life. And I think that a lot of these kids uh, turned to the internet, you know, because they didn't have friends or because they were made fun of or something like that. Like I had never really dealt with that when I was younger. Um, so we just kind of grew up very differently. And they're also from different parts of the world as well. Like New York is a very different place than a lot of places out there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just had a different sort of vibe, I guess. So, you know, it was whatever, but I remember the first time that I went to one of those shows it was in Philadelphia and it was actually very like wild, like to see a crowd, like screaming, like my name. And like, it, it was very, it was crazy to see that, you know? And the reason why I did these things, by the way, was for money, like, because I had none. And they were like, we're going to give you $600 to come. And I was like, oh, fuck. All right. Yeah. Like I'm in, you know? So like the, the playlist thing, they put you up, they pay you like a couple hundred bucks. And you just kind of chill. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go. I was good friends with the kid, Joey, who was in like the Settle Down Kids thing. So I was like, I'm just going to, you know, be attached to this kid's hip. And I'm just going to be fucking drunk the whole time also. So like, that's really what it was. And so many people like tell me they have so many stories. Not so many people, but like a couple of people have told me like, yeah, I saw you a playlist when I was younger and you were fucked up. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I'm just trying to get through. Just trying to get through. But I stopped doing that because it just, it just didn't feel genuine. It, it felt full it felt stupid that just really did like i'm like who the fuck am i for these people to be paying money vip tickets to fucking you know like this isn't what i wanted to do i didn't want to you know make a dollar from it i didn't think it was part of the job at all like i thought that it was just like a a i felt like i was taking advantage of children <laughs> you know so i was like no i don't i don't want to do this it didn't felt like it, it wasn't part of the job in my opinion it, my job was to create content make people laugh and then you get paid from advertisers for that but not this like you know, meet and greet type of shit. Like that's, you know, I don't really have an interest in that. And I think another thing too, with like the way you said, the way you grew up with just growing up with your friends, playing sports, like that's probably kept you grounded through this whole process, right? Like, I feel like if you ever tried to like play the, I have a million followers card on one of your friends, like it would be game over, right? Like I'm sure that's really helped keep you grounded through the whole thing. Yeah. 100%. I mean, my, my friends, like, although very supportive and protective at the time, um, when everything was sort of popping off, like very much would never let me do something like that, nor would my family, nor does anyone really give a fuck 
You know what I mean? Like, and no one gives a shit. If anything, I think everyone's just kind of, not everyone, but like at the time, I think everyone's just kind of like, this is cool for now, but what are you going to do forever kind of thing? You know what I mean? So it's, it, it, it before the, uh, the techno- technological boom of all this shit, where it was just kind of like, oh, now you can turn it into a job or whatever. It was kind of just like, yeah, this is cool, but like, dude, get a degree. Um, so yeah, I think that I've been very grounded for those reasons as well. But also, I just you know the way that I was raised. Like, I'm just not that type of person, I don't think. And at what point then did it become, this is going to be the full-time thing now? Like, obviously, you, you saved the money, you left Elite daily. But like, at what point did you realize that, oh, this is going to be the thing? <sighs> I don't, I don't know that there was an actual moment that I was like, yo, but I, I do remember I left Elite Daily and one of the things that was like very helpful for me that I ended up like learning from them was d- like just directly uploading videos to Facebook, which I don't even fucking do anymore. And then I think about it, but like at the time I was like, you know what, like this was a good way that they generated views and this and that because whatever fucking algorithm that's changed a thousand times since then. They were getting shared a lot more. They were getting pushed up to people's uh, feeds. So if you got people to like your page um, and you posted a video on it like natively, not a YouTube link, because they were like pushing those down because it would take them away from the site. So if you would like natively upload it to YouTube, then they would be like, oh, look at this video. And they would put it at the top of people's feeds. So you would get more exposure that way. So I was doing that for a little bit. And then I started, you know, the fucking um, idiots of the internet. And the first one that I did, I put it on Facebook. And it got shared a lot and it, it, it went pretty viral. I think it got a million views uh, in like two days. And I was like, oh shit, like this is crazy. And then that was sort of the start of those like staple videos that I was making, like people of Walmart and fucking Tinder and tattoos or whatever. Like I was just repeating this fucking thing that like worked um, that one time. And then eventually grew my page from like 20,000 likes to like over 4 million, like doing that. Um, so yeah, that was like the biggest thing for me. So that was around the time I think that I was like, okay, so I was making money from doing that. But that's when everything started to exponentially grow. Was when that video went sort of like viral and but there wasn't a t- there wasn't a video that ever went viral that it was like, "Oh my god, 10 million views or 20 million views and like shared a bunch of It was like very like they went viral. Like you had like like I said, I had like a million views and I was like, "Holy shit." So then I just kept doing it and then it was like growing in that way. So it was like the next one that I would do would do a million views and then the next one would do like 1.3. And like it was very progressive in that way. So it wasn't like this big moment. It was just kind of like, here's the time to be like, you know, doing everything the way that I was um, and everything was like growing. And then that's progressively, I started to feel like, okay, I'm making enough money now. And then obviously opportunities came along the way that I was like, okay, I'm fucking doing this shit. What's the pressure like when every video is exponentially doing a little bit better than the last one? Like I said, 1 million, 1. 1.3. What happens if you get like one with 500,000 views? Like, is there a pressure that you're putting on yourself to keep growing at that point? Like what's going through your mind? It never happened to me. I don't know. Like, it's, I, I, honestly, I wish I had an answer for that, but I, it never really happened to me. And, and I don't really know. I, I think that at that time, I was just kind of focused on doing it every week and like the consistency and like staying on top of things was really all I cared about. And I always felt like when I was making videos, like people just need to see this, like they just need to like, I just need to get it in front of a couple of other of of people. Um, Didn't do any sort of advertising whatsoever, never paid advertising anything. It was all just me putting out videos every Tuesday, you know, and, and ended up working out. But yeah, like I said, I think that, I think that, um, it, it never really happened. I never like was getting a million views on something and I put something out and did like 500,000. Never, it never happened. So I, I don't know, unless I like took some time off. Like I, I did videos during the pandemic that I like, I was like in my house, like going crazy. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a couple of, I did like five videos, I think. And, and those didn't, weren't like the same as, cause I had stopped doing YouTube for like two years. Uh, and then though, but they still did well. I think two of them have a million. And then the other ones have like, you know, a lot like a, over 500,000 or something like that. So like, they're still doing well, you know, <laughs> it's great. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I think consistency is the biggest thing and I was in it for the long haul. So it's like, regardless, they, I could have had a video that did a hundred thousand and I would have still put out videos. It, you know, it was, it was more so just believing in that I can adjust and, you know, continue to excel, I guess. 
Yeah. And it's doing it. That's really interesting because it's doing it for the process, not the outcome. You know what I mean? Like if you are tied, how many, like you're like, you were focused, like you said, on, on just getting a new video up every week and not how many views it got, which I think is important for people. Cause like we kind of talked about earlier, kids expect everything to pop off right away. So when they put up a video and nothing happens, that's when they give up. But if they're doing it just to get the, the consistency, like you said, is definitely the most important part. Yeah. And you know, I, I do a lot of, you know, uh, whatever, like advising for people like for companies or for individuals or anyone. Um, and I tell them all the time, I'm like, listen, you really can't think of this as a social media, not the companies, but like you can really can't think of this as a money maker. Like you really have to just like to do it because, and that's the only advice I can give because that's the only advice that I know is that when I was doing it, I didn't even know it was possible to make money or to turn it into a career. Maybe I knew the money was like a little bit possible, but you didn't know how much money people were making like now they're fucking buying houses, driving fucking Lambos down the street. You know what I mean? It's like, it's crazy. So that was not a thing. None of this was like, you know, ever possible in my mind. I, I did it because I legit, like genuinely enjoy doing it. And I think, you know, one of the weirder problems that we have nowadays is that a lot of kids try to force themselves into this role of like, I'm going to be this person or I'm going to do this and that. It's like, if you're just not that type of person, but you're just trying to fit in, you're trying to, it's probably not going to come across as like super genuine. And I think that an audience can see that, you know, but there is a pressure to, to have followers and have likes and to have content, which is crazy. You know, like it, I was the only one that I knew for miles that was me, literally the only person in my entire life, in my circle, not just my circle, but the extended circle. So like, Three degrees of separation from people that I knew, no one was doing this, you know, like I was the only person. So now it's like weird if you're not creating some sort of content or you don't know someone that's creating content or has a podcast or does whatever, like literally no one was doing this except me. So everyone's looking at me like I'm fucking crazy, you know? So I, I think that, you know, there, you do have that, like everyone's trying and they're, you know, cause they hear that there's a lot of money in it and it sounds like a good opportunity, but sometimes it's just not what you're meant to do or not what you know, you're, I don't know, like born for, I guess. I don't fucking know. Like, is it weird how things have flipped? Like how it used to be, you were the weird one. And now if you're not making anything, you're the weird one. Or like how kids nowadays, like the number one job is to be a YouTuber or like even what I thought was crazy is like, I interviewed a guy last week. His name's Sean. He goes, his YouTube's name's It's Your Boy. It's got like 2.8 million. And I, I thought he's been making videos for a long time. And we were just talking about upcoming podcasts I had. And I mentioned you, he's like, oh yeah, I used to watch Joe before I ever made videos. And I was like, wait, I, I, I thought you were like a throwback YouTuber. Now you're saying you used to watch Joe before you ever watched YouTube. Like, is it crazy how much things have changed in those 10 years and how you're considered like an OG YouTuber and everything like that? Do you ever think about that? Yeah, I, I honestly didn't start hitting me until recently. I was on the phone with my um, ad manager and he was talking about some like very famous and big name people who are in like the social media space mentioning my name and being like, oh, I want to like, do it the way that he did it and like this and that and like mention these things i'm just like this is crazy because like when i started doing it i remember one of the first times i met i it was at uh, the new york uh, oh no actually i went to three of those shows that i'm talking about because i went to a new york one and uh the at the after party i saw timothy de la ghetto and he to me is like an og you know like him and jenna marbles were like the ogs because like him i knew uh, I was a big fan of Jimmy Tatro also. I've never met him, but yeah, I, you know, I was a big fan of him. Still a big fan of him. I love, I think he's great. Uh, and Tim, I saw him and I was mad drunk and I had this conversation with him of just being like, bro, like you're like an OG. Like, you know, like I've watched you when I had nothing and I was just like, this is just a like, cool thing. And I never thought that I could do what you can do. And you know, I was like, you know, at the time I wasn't even like near that, but I was just like, it's really fucking cool. And, you know, we were just talking about, you know, and he was just like really good to me too. He was another guy. It was just like super cool to me. And, you know, just like, you know, gave me some sort of guidance or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's crazy to think about that. People now look at me as, as this person who's like, damn, you know, when I was younger, like blah, blah, blah. And the other day it happened actually like on TikTok, some kid who has like, fucking 7 million followers who's like very famous commented on one of my TikToks and just wrote like, Oh shit, Joe's on TikTok. I'm like, what the fuck? Like what the fuck is happening? You know what I mean? So it is interesting to think about, I guess like there wasn't that many people like now it's so saturated. There's so many people to like to pop off. It would be very hard. But back then I guess there wasn't that many people. So 
my name was just like in the mix. But it is it is very interesting and it is crazy to see that you know everyone wants to create content. They want to do these things. Um, I don't know that it's the healthiest thing in the world. I, I I think that like you know definitely now I have a better idea of what's going on. And and honestly, thankfully at the time, like I said, I, we weren't. No one had the social media thing. Some of my friends barely use social media anyway. You know what I mean? Like it, we're just not from that sort of generation like literally two years later like it's fucking crazy but we just weren't on it like that so even to your point of saying like isn't it weird the switch like yeah everyone has a computer in their hands at all times when we were younger if you like sat inside on the computer all day we'd be like yo this kid's a fucking nerd you know like you know so it's, it's so crazy now to think about like you're on the internet all the time always looking at things always you know this and that um so yeah, it is it is crazy to see the switch. Yeah, and since I saw a video on TikTok just the other day and it was like an old like news story about a family that's addicted to gaming and they asked one of the kids like, how often do you play? And he's like, I play for a, a max five hours a day. And that was like crazy for this like old news clip that this kid's playing video games for five hours. But I feel like now that's probably like below average at this point. Yeah, streamers doing 24 hour streams and shit. Like, yeah, stream, shout out to Frank. Streaming <laughs> while, yeah, yeah, yeah. Streaming while sleeping. Like, you know, like it's just like, it's it's crazy. Like where where it's gone um but yeah i think like like i said the most unhealthy part about this entire thing is not necessarily like the content creation or whatever it's the expectation when you're younger of or the the validation is only going to come through these comments or if you're a content creator or if you're whatever like these are the popular kids so you want to fit in with them you know like it's like being not good at sports but wanting so desperately to be on the football team that you'll do anything possible if even if you're this fucking big you're gonna get hurt you know, it's it's kind of like that, where it's like you're forcing yourself, it's like, oh, those are the popular kids. I'm gonna try and be that. It's like you don't have to fucking do these types of things. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of like pressure, especially on younger kids now, to to do stuff. And not only that, not to just have that, but do like weird shit for that attention. You know what I mean? Like to like for for young women especially to be like very provocative and like dress a certain way and like whatever. It's like eventually it starts to like it's getting too young now. Like I remember when I was like a certain age being like, Jesus Christ, the 20 year olds look like they're fucking like 28. And now it's like, dude, this girl's fucking 15. Like wearing the, like, it's, I don't know. It's, it's like, a, it's, it's, it starts to it get a little dark, but I, that's why like now all I can do is like, I'm not gonna be very preachy. Pro- probably not yet. Uh, but I think at a certain age, I'm going to be become very preachy about like how this is the devil and everyone should stop. Uh, but, or just like get a hold of it, you know, because I mean, I think everyone's been there, like feeling like you're addicted to this shit and you just can't like whatever it's, I mean, it's made to make you addicted. So it's like, it's, I don't know. I think eventually people will understand and they're going to be like, listen, like once everyone hits 25, they're just going to be like, okay, I need to start asking myself some questions here. Yeah. And I think like you can probably speak as a position of authority of this over anyone because like you were there you did grow you had all the success you were there but then you also made the decision to stop like youtube specifically you know what i mean like you were still it's not like your channel was going down you're like i'm just gonna stop it now before it hits the bottom like you were still pulling great numbers but you made the decision to stop and so like what ultimately led to that decision was it just kind of like a combination of everything we just talked about or like no the social media stuff didn't actually hit me until after that um that really was just a decision i made personally because it just wasn't doing anything for me anymore like i I felt like it wasn't motivating it it wasn't making me feel like i was being creative it felt like i found a formula that equaled money and i was just repeating that um which i my friend i'm not my business partner makes jokes all the time that i hate money because i turn down shit all the time and again this goes back to me just being just wanting to do whatever the fuck i want to do like whatever the fuck that means And at the time I was like, you know, this is just not like doing it for me anymore. Like I used to have this like exciting feeling and butterfly feeling every time I uploaded a video and I would be super into, you know, looking at the feedback and this and that. But then I was just like, you know, what? this just doesn't feel like it's good anymore to me, you know, and and the videos were getting millions of views and they were like, I put out a video and it would get fucking 400,000 views overnight. And by the time, you know, it was Friday, it'd have a million views. And, And this was like right then I was just like, I'm done. And I honestly don't even know how I, I don't even know how I did that. Cause I don't think I even said anything to anyone. Like I just stopped doing it because I just didn't want to do it anymore. It just didn't feel cool. It didn't feel funny. 
Like, I just felt like I'm just like beating a dead horse every week. You know, that's kind of how I felt. So I was like, I, I have bigger aspirations than whatever, you know, makes money. So I just don't want to do that like anymore. So I, I stopped doing it. Was that like, obviously like you didn't like doing it. So you said you were really tight when you just kind of stopped, but like how long did you think about wanting to stop? Like, was it just like on a Tuesday, you're like, oh man, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And then Thursday you were done or was it like months? Cause like, like, like we just talked about with social media built to be addictive. Like obviously there's going to be some ties there and this feels like maybe not the right thing to do. It's so like, how long did it take you to come to that decision? Um, I, I think that was also very progressive for me as well, because there were times where I was like missing a week of uploading and then I would have some excuse or I would just not put one out. And then I kind of flirted with the idea of not doing it every week, doing it every other week. But then I, I didn't like do that consistently. I didn't put that into practice, but I had like thought about that. I remember that. But then eventually I was just kind of like, dude, whatever. Like I'm not like relying on YouTube financially right now. And it, I mean, it's, it, it was literally the foundation of, you know, my business, obviously, which I, I would still say it is like to, that's the reason why all of this that I'm doing now is possible is because of that channel. But um, yeah, I think that I just like, I would miss a week here and then I would put another video out. And then I, during that time, I was just like, I didn't really have anyone to talk to at the time either, you know, because like I said, a lot of my friends just don't do this. So they're not really going to understand what I'm talking about. So I just, it was me internalizing all of this and kind of going back and forth with like, you know, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? You can't do these videos. Like if you're doing these videos when you're 35, it's just going to look fucking weird. So like, what is it? And it's, and I don't, I'm hard. I like, I don't work well without pressure, you know, like to a fault like i would put out videos every tuesday for fucking years and i didn't do any of those videos in advance i would wake up on tuesday then think about what i wouldn't even think about it honestly i wouldn't even think about it because i was just like you know what i'm i'm good at this now and and that's that and 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 it's a horrible characteristic of mine because i could have like spent and i don't even know what the fuck i was doing the rest of my time during that week either because like tuesday i would wake up and I would be like, oh, I got to put a video out tonight by nine o'clock. And then I would start thinking about what video I can do. And then it's like, oh, if I came up with an idea, then I would do whatever research. If I had to pull some photos or tweets or whatever the fuck for it or whatever I needed to do. Or it was just like a story that I needed to write. Like whatever I had to do, I would do it that day. I would film it. I would edit it and then upload it the same day. And then I would just do that every week. I've ne- literally never, I've never even done one on a Monday. Like I've never done one a day in advance. It's always been on Tuesday. The only ones actually that I've done in advance are the ones that need to get approved because there was like an ad in it, which those were a few far in between too, because I used to say no to them all the time because they were like, oh, we need this in the first minute. I was like, see ya. Like, I've said no. I I would say I there was a, I remember one specifically like ne- sort of near the end. They were offering me $75,000 and it was for some weird game, some lizard shooting game. And already I was just like, the fu- how the fuck am I going to like come across as genuine with this shit? You know, because that's what I was really focused on. It was like, I don't want people to feel like I'm just fucking using them or like leveraging them to make money for myself. Like, I, I really wanted to like be like, okay, if I'm going to do something like that, we're going to put it at the end of the video. Because like, this is what you came for. I don't give a fuck if you watch it or not at the end of it, whatever. Probably shouldn't say that for all the advertisers out there, but I'm just saying that's that's what I've been doing. But that's, uh, that's uh, so I was like, no, I'm not putting it in the first minute. Like, it's just not happening. I've never done that. I'm never going to do it. Like, take your money and walk. I don't give a fuck. So like, I, that's always just how I've been, you know, like I, I don't want it to look like I'm just over here, just like taking people's money and, and like doing whatever the fuck I, I want with it. You know what I mean? Cause like, I think that's very off putting. Like you have people who do these advertisements for these weird companies that end up being a scam and then they're driving around in a Lamborghini, you know, like, and if I want to live a certain life, like I, I live in a nice apartment, but if I live in this apartment and I do that on the back of these weird shitty advertisements or this and that, then people are going to be like, fuck this kid. Like he's not a good, he's just a shitty guy that he just like used his thing to take from people. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I wanted to have some sort of integrity. Like you have to make your money obviously, but you need some sort of integrity in, in this as well. I think to have longevity at least, or to just be likable. Like I don't, I don't want to like rub anyone the wrong way. Like, I want to be likable to people, you know? 
Yeah. No, a few things based on that. One is like my, when it comes to like that game you're talking about, my favorite thing is it's like when a YouTuber will post a video of some random mobile app that's like, I've been playing this all the time. And like, I'm like, no, you fucking haven't. Yeah. There's no way you're playing well, this game. And that's the whole thing too now, you know, with, with everything, like, and this is why I start to hate Instagram is because the entire thing, like everyone's a, everyone's a page, everyone's a brand and everyone's this, and they're always trying to sell you something and it's their favorite and it's the best. And it's like, we all know this is bullshit. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you watch sports and you're watching, you know, these athletes get interviewed after the game, whatever they're saying, we've heard a million times before, you know, like, it's like, oh, you know, they're a good team out there, but you know, it's like, bro, just tell us to you fucking hate the other, you know what I mean? Like, just say what you, you can't say what you mean. And it's kind of the same thing with these, with these brands. And like, like I said, so many like micro influencers, like they have all these things. That's so it's like, they're constantly selling you jewelry or fucking this or that. But it's, it's, it's just constant. And none of it is like genuine like no one is really meaning it like maybe a small percentage but and it's just very off-putting in my opinion and it, i don't think there's a lot of longevity in that because when you are constantly trying to sell me something that is the best or this and that's like bro like give me a fucking break here you know what i mean so that's why that's another reason why i, I used to I, I never really did instagram shit either i would do it when i was like strapped for cash and just be like i need to fucking this is a good payday or sometimes you know what i'll do is the most recent one I did, I think it was for the Kentucky Derby or some app or whatever. And the reason why I did that was because they, uh, one of my cousin is, it was the company. was like my cousin's best friend or like one of his best friends. And I was like, yeah, of course. You know, and I would turn into like a funny thing, like whatever. But there was never a time where I was like, oh man, this is like a, a dope way to leverage everything that I'm doing to make more money. Cause like you, it's just not the way to scale in this kind of thing, you know, like brand deals and shit. You can't lean on that stuff. Cause like, it's just like, if you do enough of them where you're going to make a lot of money doing brand deals, you either better have fucking David Dobrik numbers. So they pay you a quarter million dollars every time you fucking say a company's name, or you better do a billion ads. And then I mean, by that point, everyone's going to hate you, you know? So it's kind of like, you got to play this sort of middle ground here. Yeah. And where the proof is in the pudding with that, it's like, I don't know exact numbers, but I got to imagine the basement yard is one of the most subscribed to Patreon accounts on the planet. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, well, I don't know about that, but like, it's, it's definitely like, uh, pretty up there. I think that in the in comedy podcasts, you know, and just in podcasts, it's in the top 25, I believe it's like 23. So like, that's, that's, you know, that's great. But like, also that's another thing. It's like, I didn't really try to sell people shit all the time. And even like merch, I'm like super inconsistent with merch. So I never really like ask for people for a lot of shit. Um, especially if I don't think it's like super worth it or just worth their time, you know? And so how have you gone about like with, with the Patreon specifically, like that's cause I think you guys are 10,000 now. Have you hit the 10,000 mark? Uh, no, we're like in between nine and 10. Okay, so on your way to 10,000 people, which is just an insane number when it comes to Patreon, how have you built a community like that? You know what I mean? Because like, that's not a common thing. Like A lot of people have followings, but not everybody has a community. You built like a genuine community. How have you, how have you done that? Dude, anyone who has an answer for that question is just fucking lying to you because I have no fucking idea. Like, I honestly think it's just, I could guess, but I could be wrong. You know, I, I think that when you do the podcast and kind of things that a way that I've done them is I've, I've tried to be very genuine in everything so that people kind of feel like they know a certain part of me. You're never going to know like who I am or like, you know, whatever as like a legitimate person. But like I said, the switch is, is, is not that big anymore. It used to be very big where it's like, this is a completely different person than who I am. But now it's like not very big. So like what you're seeing is not necessarily, it's just an exaggerated version. You know, it's not anything crazy. So you try to be as genuine as possible and you don't try to sell people something all the time and, you know, whatever. Uh, and yeah, I think just making it worth it, you know, like uh, once we started doing an episode, like an extra episode every single week on there, that's really when these things started to take off. And also just the way that I packaged and, and going about like uh, promoting that, you know, and, and coming up with like, cool ideas for the patreon it, it seemed worth it for people and uh you know it, it grows every month so it, you know clearly you know i think people think that it's worth it and and you know i i, I don't know I, like i don't really have an answer as far as the community goes like i think that people 
I have no fucking idea, to be honest. I'm just glad that they like watching it and they feel like it's worth it to join the Patreon, you know? For sure. I think another thing that, too, that I find just so impressive with your the community that you have is it's, it's like broad. You know what I mean? It's not like it's just dudes 18 to 24 or anything like that. You know what I mean? And like, just for an example, like I talk about my podcast, my family all the time. I've had entrepreneurs, I've had pro athletes, I had the founder of Starbucks. I've never gotten a text before a podcast. My aunt texted me randomly today, happy Joe day. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Like, and my little brother equally like, well, so like my aunt and my little brother both texted me today before this podcast because they knew I was interviewing you on the show today. That just like shows like how broad like your audience and community is. Like I have both my aunt, like on two opposite sides. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy to me that like, you've built a community like that. Dude, it's- like even you saying that, like that's going to stick with me forever. Like, I, I, cause I, I don't know how this happened. You know, like I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and I, I really think like, it's validating obviously to hear that, especially because a lot of this shit, which brought people together was when I was younger and like, none of it was on purpose. Didn't know what the fuck I was, I never paid attention to demographics. Nothing. Like I wasn't like, Oh, we got to hit this and this market. And what like, I was an idiot, bro. Like I, I didn't know anything like this. I didn't start doing any of that stuff until I was 26. Like, and I'm 29 now. So like just the last three years, it's only been that time. But like, I literally was just like trying, I don't know. And, and it's, it's, it's really awesome to hear that. Honestly, it's crazy too, that even like younger people would even know who I am at this point. Like, I feel like there's like a billion ways to get content now like i guess back in the day it was like a little different especially with facebook and that's why i think that it, there is that discrepancy is because youtube was very young facebook was a little older um and when they're both kind of growing at the same time then you get that sort of like clash um with the demographics and whatnot uh but yeah man that is that's that is really fucking cool to hear i i, I honestly I, and i i can tell now too like there's, there's people who are either recognize me on the street or they're like see a video or and i'll see a comment or something where i'm like a time machine for them like they see me and they go oh my god like when i was in fucking my freshman year of high school or they'll say like when i was fucking 11 like blah blah, blah. like it's it's just it's it's crazy to think that i've been doing it that long you know like it, it doesn't hit me until i hear things like this and it's just like you know, it's, it's extremely validating and it's fucking, it's cool. It makes me sort of like reminisce on the whole journey as well. Cause I, I'm not really one to reflect too much. I, I'm always thinking like forward. My mom used to tell me that I'm never excited and that, uh, like I would have like a meeting and she'd be like, Oh my God, that's so exciting. And I'd be like, no, yeah, it's great. Whatever. And she's like, how are you not just like jumping up and down? I'm just like, ma, I just like, I gotta keep, I'm just like ready for this shit. You know, like I, I just had my head down the whole time. So it is cool now to kind of look back on those things and, and think about how fucking cool all that was and like so do people still come up and talk to you in the street like does that happen often like especially now that you've stopped doing the youtube thing where and with podcasting with being audio a lot of people aren't always seeing your face like do people still come up to you as much as they used to yeah for sure i mean uh, you know most of my time is spent in new york and you know but yeah i mean it happens like people come, when i go out they, they recognize me they'll say you know things like that um it's a little different now i would say just because I used to have crazy social anxiety about it because it would either be like, cause at the peak of everything, when everything was like just rocketing up, uh, I had this weird social anxiety. Cause I mean, at that, that was the only time also that I ever dealt with like legitimate, like hate. I don't get like, I, that's not something I ever deal with. Like it's, it's no one ever like sends me horrible messages or death threats or it's never, it's never happened. You know, like it, it, like people just don't, for whatever reason, I don't, uh, maybe I don't see it. I don't pay attention enough, but I've never like really gotten a lot of people like giving me shit for something or it, it, it's just not, it just hasn't happened to me. So I, I, maybe that would be a little difficult to deal with. The only time this did happen where there was kids that like, I kind of like people I went to high school with, like their friends from different schools. Like there was a time where they were just like, they would say a lot of shit and talk about how they wanted to fuck me up or some shit or like, Oh, this kid's fucking gay or like whatever the fuck. Uh, and that was like, but that was like 2012, you know? And it, and it was like a six month span and then it, it never happened again. Uh, so, so for the last, however long, like I've never really dealt with any of like the hate or any of like the, the negativity that comes with this sort of thing. Of course you get these weird fucking comments sometimes and like, you know, people, prying into your life but i try to do my you know best job with separating my like this 
and my actual life because I still want that. Like, I don't want to feel like I owe people to be posting about my life or something like that. Cause like, I, I don't think that at all. And I don't want them getting it confused either. Like I very much try to separate these things because it's like, I'm just here to entertain, like, and just don't even ask me anything like about my life, you know, like either I'll share it or I don't, but don't fucking ask me because I'm not telling you. Like, it's just, uh, if you don't know, it's because I don't want you to know. And like, you just don't need to know, you know, frankly, you know, you have to have some sort of privacy, I guess. Cause I, I always thought it was weird too. When people like a couple videos, they would break up and then put out a video and they'd be like, I feel like we owe it to you guys to tell you what happened. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, no, you don't. Like, these are random people on the internet. And I think you get yourself into that situation by sharing too much and, and by, you know, opening it up or having people like call your house or having people show up to your house because they feel like they know you. I'm trying to make it so it's like you, you, you are entertained by me, but you don't fucking know anything. And that used to be the case when I was younger. I would post a lot more about my life, but then people would be showing up to my house. They would call my mom's house phone. They would fucking, you know, it was just weird shit. So I was like, I just don't want to, or they would follow all my friends and send weird messages to my friends and shit. And I was just like, guys, you know what I mean? Like, it was just like, you know, whatever, but I'm, I'm older now. So during that time, like those people that probably would do those things were maybe my age or, or a little younger are now like in their mid twenties. And like, no one gives a shit that much to be doing that kind of thing anymore. You know, like it's, I don't have 16 year old fans, you know what I mean? Like it's just, or maybe I do, but they're like a very small percentage, but it just doesn't happen. Like no one in their mid twenties is like freaking out when they're seeing me or anything like that. It's just kind of like, Oh, Hey, cool. You know, it's kind of like one of those things. What's the weirdest fan interaction you've had? Like I've had people on here who've gotten like toenail clippings in the mail and stuff like that. Like what's the weirdest thing that's happened to you? Um, oh, there was one, um, it was Easter and my, I was at my aunt's house for Easter and my dad was home by himself and a woman showed up to the door, knocked on the door. My dad opened the door like, yeah, can I help you? And she's like, oh, we're looking for Joe. And my dad's name was like, oh, I'm Joe. And she goes, no, we're looking for Joe, like the YouTuber, like whatever. And now my dad is like, yo, my dad, for anyone who doesn't know, is a fucking maniac. So like, he's like, what? He's like, what? And she's like, yeah, we were looking for Joe. And these are my daughters and their friends. There was like five girls there. And we wanted to see if he wanted to come to our house and we'll give him $200. And my dad was just like, are you fucking like out of your mind? Like, what do you, he's like, it's Easter Sunday. You're showing up to my house with your daughters, trying to get my son to come in the car with you on Easter Sunday. Like, what are you doing here? You know? And that was like the craziest fucking thing ever. Uh, but I wasn't even there. I was at my aunt's house. And my dad told me that story when I got home. And he was like, what the, f-? like, he was just like confused. He's like, I get like girls showing up and doing something. He's like, but this adult woman was knocking on my, our door asking for you to get in our fucking car like what's going on you know like that was a little crazy that's probably the craziest one i don't have a lot of like weird sort of interactions or whatever most of it is like most of the ones that are funny to me are like the backhanded compliments of like one people being like oh my god dude i used to watch you all the time in eighth grade which is like just funny to me because it's like especially when at the time i was still doing youtube videos and it was kind of like man, I'm still doing it. And you're just kind of like, dude, I used to watch you, but fuck that. Or, or them being like, are you still, are you still doing it? I'm like, yeah, still doing it. You know, like one of those things. And then the other one is like people who try to overcompensate because they are like worried that you'll think they're a fan. So I've had people come up to me and be like, yo, my friends want to take a picture with you. I don't know who you are though. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool, no problem. And they're like, yeah, but seriously, I'm like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know you. Like, I've never heard. Of, I don't, I just don't know who you are. I'm like, listen, I get it. Like, you don't have to know who I am. Like, it's totally fine. I don't mind taking a picture. But they try to hammer this thing home of like, I don't fucking know you. So don't treat me like. And I'm just like, I literally, I don't. I'm not part of this conversation. Like, you're just talking to yourself. Like, dude, I really don't know who you are. And I'm like, I get it, dude. A lot of people don't. It's totally fine. So it's like that, those kinds of things are like always the funniest to me when people do those two things. I have a headline here that's maybe the guy who wrote that was trying to be like, I don't know who this guy is. So I'm going to make the headline generic. 2016 auto evolution. Had a drive tutorial by guy in Nike tank top is hilarious. 
yeah literally like it's it's i don't know you have you have funny interactions with people sometimes but now I, for the last like you know like i said the last three four years has been like completely normal interactions nothing crazy no weird fan behavior or whatever like it's literally just how i would approach anyone you know that i saw on the street like i saw chris rock recently i was in fucking miami and i was coming out of a restaurant and i saw him and i was like oh hey chris rock i was like yo big fan boom that's it that's like usually that's like all of my interactions now like none of it's like oh my god like when i was younger it would it, it would happen that would happen uh and it would always make me like super uncomfortable so sometimes i wouldn't even go out and be like oh i can't I can't deal with this like like it just makes me feel weird because then everyone's just kind of looking around like what the fuck is this kid like fuck this kid you know what I mean? so, that's the reaction i would have if i was them yeah, no, that's fair. And I know we're out of time here, so I'm just going to my last two questions. There's like tons more we could talk about. We didn't even get to touch on your new game, but I will give you an opportunity to plug that before we before we jump off here. Um, but like you said, you don't really look back and reflect on it too often. But when you do look back, do you look back fondly? Or is it like, oh, fuck, I, I made it through it, thank God. Or like, how do you how do you feel when you do take that time to look back? I love it, man. Like, uh, if anything, like, I... I definitely don't like regret any of that shit or I definitely don't feel like, Oh, that was a mistake or whatever. Like none of it was a mistake. I think that it was all looking back. I think it was calculated. Um, it's inspiring to me. I always think about my 19 year old self as like inspiring because when you get to a certain point of success, like a lot of people can just like get complacent and then they just kind of feel like, ah, oh, you know, whatever and blah, blah, blah. But like, I can't like, I, that slowly kills me just being complacent, but it's, it's hard to notice that you're being that unless a certain amount of time has passed. Like there's, you can go six months and then feel like I haven't really tried to grow or try to do anything like creative or even exciting. Like not even anyone in any sort of industry of just being like, you know, I do the same thing every day, you know, and it's not about creating content. It's just about like, you know, maybe I need to like see new restaurants or travel a little bit or like go to this new place. Like you need to keep your life exciting. So for me, um professionally at least there needs to be some sort of exciting thing because then i feel like i'm it's like it kills me you know like and if i go six months of being like i'm doing the same thing over and over again it's the same reason why i stopped doing youtube because it just kind of felt like uh i'm just doing the same thing i'm beating a dead horse like and it's fine but like challenge yourself you know um so i look back and, and it's definitely you know inspiring for me i think back to being 19 years old and nothing was going to get in my way. And I was just kind of like, this is what I'm going to do. And I don't even care what the fucking outcome is, you know? And, and that's kind of the advice that I give to a lot of people that are either starting a business or doing whatever. It's like, bro, you have to really put your head down and not give a shit and not look at the numbers, not think about like, you really just have to have tunnel vision and just be like, I'm just going to do it anyway. It's just exciting to me. It's just cool. And it's something that would, you know, make me happy and keep my life exciting. Um, because at, at that time, like, I wasn't worried about likes. I was worried about views. I wasn't about, worried about comments. None of this or followers. None of it. I, I literally up until I was like 24, 25 years old, didn't care about any of that. Like I literally just had my head down and I just really enjoyed the work. I really enjoyed creating the content and, and having, and, and, you know, entertaining people and what, and obviously reaping the benefits of that as well of like, you know, people respect you and, and they see you as like one of the funniest people or, or, you know, you're good or whatever. Like that is like, an awesome feeling. So I, I, you know, look back and obviously I'm not doing those YouTube videos anymore. I'm doing a couple podcasts and a couple side projects at the, at the moment, but there is a project that I'm working on that I would say probably uh, the end of this year or early next year that I'm like super excited about. And it's not a product, it's content, but like, and it's not, a TV show or a movie or anything like that. Um, I, I, but it's very exciting because I think it's very authentic to me and I think that people are going to enjoy it. And I, and it, it feels sort of like I have to go back into the mind of being 19 again and just like not worrying about any of this shit and just fucking doing it because you love to do it. And it's just fucking fun. And it's just, you know, and, and people like it, you know, like, and, and, and that's another thing that's super validating for me too, is like creating this content, like people just fucking, if they like it, then they have to like me because I'm not really trying too hard here. It's not like I'm sitting with a bunch of writers and we're coming up with jokes and it's a collaborative effort. Like I'm, it's really just like a gut reaction to a picture or to, you know, something that happened in the news or, or something. It's like all really like a gut reaction. So it's like validating in that uh, it's worked out for me just being authentic to who I am. 
So it, it gives you a, it feels powerful in a way of being like, well, my gut reaction is like something that people enjoy. So, you know, and I also think I also like don't the responsibility of that also is like definitely weighs on me, not in a bad way of being like, I definitely like pay attention to that. It's like, you can't just like be a fucking asshole when people are, you know what I'm saying? Like that you're this person to people like, don't get caught up in this and that and start being someone different because it's gotten you this far and this is who I enjoy being. And I honestly, I mean, I don't think it's really even fucking possible to become something different for me because I like think about it so much, but uh, yeah, I, I think that I'm super excited for this new thing that that's coming out. I'm not even fucking like say what it is because it's not like even done, but uh, super excited. And um, yeah. So I mean, to answer your question again, uh, definitely fondly, none of it, is is bad in my opinion like it's all it's all great it's all part of the journey it's 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 actually fun to see the growth from there and to think and and to go back and watch these videos and be like this is what i thought was fucking funny like what a fucking asshole you know or just like oh yeah nice misogynistic fucking joke there bud you know what i mean like people were laughing at this shit like it's just like funny to see that sort of growth I'm glad I'm glad you look back on it fondly and I'm also excited for whatever it is you're working on. I'll definitely tune in when it when this content is released. Um, but my last question here, and I ask everybody this question at the end of every podcast, and I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. Pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question, you'll get the one hundred percent honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? <laughs> That's a good question. I think it would just be like, am I a good person? Because I, I feel like, um, I feel like that's all this really is, you know, like, I feel like that, that just being a good dude, you know, like I, I've always said, like, I, I, I just want to be someone that everyone like talks good about, like, well about, or whatever the fuck the grammar is. Not that he has a uh, proper English, but you know, or proper grammar. There you go, two in a row. Uh, but you know, people who actually know me, like I, I like to think that I'm I'm a good friend and a good person, and that regardless if something happened, um, you know, I fucking made some joke and you get canceled for it in the future or whatever. But like the people who really know you, they're like, dude, like I know you. Like you're a good guy or you're, you know, whatever. And that's really all I really care about. A lot of what I do and a lot of what my future aspirations are, are about giving back. You know, like I, I grew up around people who, who did that. My father is a very selfless person um, and he would drop everything he was doing for somebody. You know, he, he, uh, he lived in fucking long island for months after sandy like destroyed all those houses and he was just like helping build all these houses or whatever because he has background construction and he's just a good guy man you know and 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 my my sister um worked in school works in schools and she does like speech therapy uh my brother um was working as like a para for for kids so it's like I, i'm like around all these people that are like improving the lives of others you know and i think that also helps me stay grounded too because everything that I do is very self-centered. It's about me. And it's about like, what can I do to make more money for me? So it's like, with that, I think comes responsibility in that, you know, if you're going to assume this position where everything has to be about you and you're going to be the star and the center of attention or whatever, then you have a responsibility to also do some good with that as well. You know, and I've been blessed enough to be in a, a, a position of, uh, financial security for quite some time as well so i make sure to give back and i and that and it doesn't even that excites me as well to be able to do that you know and i don't even think it takes much to be honest with you like i don't know like i mean i i maybe i just don't pay attention enough but i don't know that a lot of people do it as much as i would if i was them you know what i mean so i i think that it just it just feels good to to do those kinds of things. And yeah, I think that's what I would ask. I, th I would ask like, am I a good person? Or is there like, you know, and if the answer is no, then I would have to do some like soul searching, which I, I'm like totally okay with a no as well. 
because <laughs> I, I'm all about that, like growth and just real conversation in that way. You know, like I, I would, I, I only keep people around me that challenge me and that like, no one ever tells me yes. Like the people that I really enjoy talking to and, and spending my time with, they're very hard to please. And they're very hard to um, impress. You know, they're very supportive, but when I need them to be like critical, they're very critical. So like, that is very important as well. So I think that I would like to think this crystal ball would be critical as shit. So I would just probably ask like, am I a good person? And honestly, if they tell me yes too, then I know that I'm, I'm doing the right thing and I'm on a good path and just trying to continue that. Um, while also, uh, you know, keep like keeping myself happy and staying excited in that way as well. That's a, that's a good question. You know, I've had people like look at it from that kind of angle, but no one's ever asked the question in that exact way before. So I think. I think that's a good, an important question to ask. Like you said, like that's kind of like the whole point we're here to be a good person, right? Yeah, so. man. I think that's it. I think that's it. I, I honestly, I can honestly say too, with no bullshit, because I would never fucking lie about something like this. It sound like a cheesy fucking piece of shit. <laughs> uh, but that's always been important to me. Like literally always, like even from a young age, like I, I would say things all the time to my mom just being like, you know, I just want to like help people. Like I just want to, and I'm very much the friend too, that people come to, to confide in. And and they come to me and I have no problem like setting the time aside to, to sit and like talk about like I prefer that, you know, and, and, and people know that they can come to me with their shit and I'm not going to be judgmental and I'm not going to be, you know, whatever. Like I, I, enjoy, I very much enjoy that. I actually have like aspirations of being uh, like a therapist one day when I'm in like my 40s and I'm like, fuck all this shit. Like I'm just going to do this now. Um, like I, 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 I do enjoy that. I, I, for some reason, I feel like I innately have some sort of understanding of, um, you know, just human emotion and just some sort of emotional maturity that was sort of innate in me from a young age. So I, uh, you know, so it's always been a thing for me. And, and, and that's why I feel like I, I try to attach some sort of charitable aspect to a lot of the things that I do just so I don't like lose that. Because if like, for me, if that was like the basis of all these things, I'm like, and you could go into the like, Oh, he's, he likes entertaining because the saddest people entertain. It's like, that to me is bull. Like, I'm not sad, bro. Like, I'm just not like, I've, just, I've never been like, they always say like comedians are like, you know, they have some sort of sadness in them and that's why they're able to make, like, it's really not about that at all. Like it's cool that you can equate the two of being like, Oh, well giving back and making people happy is sort of like similar. It's like, no, it's not like, I'm not going to count that. Like I'm, I, I really think that it's important to, you know, do what you want, like professionally do what you got to do, whatever. But when you're in a position to help people, you fucking help people. You know what I mean? You're, you're supposed to do that. I think that if everyone did that, you know, it would be a much like better place. And I don't think it takes a lot. I think that everyone can do that. Um, but yeah, cause that means a lot more too. I'm sorry. I'm rambling, but like that, like just means more, bro. Like if you put out a video that gets 50 million views, people forget about it in fucking three years. But if you like really help someone out of a pinch or you fucking, you you uh whatever you just do this like really nice favor for someone they they don't forget that and that's how they introduce you to people too and i don't want to be introduced professionally either i don't want people say oh this is how you know whatever like i would rather than be like this is the guy who fucking drove all the way out to my house and like whatever like that's a story that they tell everyone you know what i mean like you want to be that guy you don't want to be like this guy's got a million followers you know like i fucking fuck all that like because that just like lives here online and it's a fake thing, you know, it's, it's, it's an entertainment, but it's not real. And, you know, the, the real stuff, uh, you know, I'm using the next chapter of my life to double down on, uh, and, cause I think that stuff, like it means more, it lasts more and, and it makes you, if you're good enough at it, sort of immortal. People just tell stories about you. <laughs> I think that's the goal. I like that. That's a good note to end on, man. I think, and I think it's an important takeaway. Like it's a really good takeaway to end the podcast on is, is this internet stuff is cool, but like, it's not the real world and doing good shit in the real world is what matters. Just don't get caught up in it. You know, like it's fun. It's a fun thing to do, but man, really don't get caught up on it because if you become a selfish person, like no one's going to like you, your fucking, your whole business is going to be shot to shit. And you also are just not going to be a good person. And like, you don't want to be that. You don't want to have a circle this big. And like where people brag about that, they brag about having a so few friends. Like, it's very easy to be a good person to people and to like attract people who are also good people. Like if you just like put that out, it comes back to you, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and it's unfortunate because you see people that have like 
50 Cartier bracelets and like all these watches and like nice clothes or driving crazy cars or whatever. And it's like, man, you could be living literally like this, but also doing like very impactful things as well. Like if I had like a hundred million dollars, like, you know what I mean? Like you could be doing so much with that and you wouldn't even know, but we're, I don't know. Sometimes people just get lost in that. I desperately try not to, not to get lost in that. Mm-hmm. No, that's important. I really, like I said, I really like that. It's a good, good note to end on. And I know I'm over time here. I took a little bit more of your time than I said I was going to. Uh, so I want to thank you for taking time to come on the show. I want to give you the floor now. Where can the people find you? Where can they find everything you're working on? Plug anything and everything you got right now. Uh, you guys can just follow me at Joe Santagato on pretty much, you know, wherever, uh, except Pinterest. I got to be working on that. But uh, yeah, the, the podcast is The Basement Yard and Other People's Lives is another podcast that I do with my buddy Greg. And uh, I just put out a card game called Pay the Price, which is available at paythepricegame.com. It's a trivia-based game where if you get a question wrong, you have another opportunity to score a point by doing some like crazy dares, we'll call them. Um, and they range from anything like, you know, put a shoe on your hand for the rest of the game to like text one of your parents a porn link. You know, so it's like it's a crazy game. Uh, it's supposed to be a, a wild game. I tested it with my friends when we were all drunk and it was fucking mayhem. So, uh, yeah, super excited about that. Uh, PayThePriceGame.com. I think it's also uh, and it's also available on Amazon. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so we can, people can find it. I want to thank you once again for taking time to be on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through, you only listen to bits and pieces, I really appreciate you for taking time to check this out. Everyone, do me a big favor. Go and follow Joe. Go and pick up your own copy of Pay the Price. Like I said, everything will be linked in the show notes down below so you can find it. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me everywhere on social media at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening. We'll talk soon.